So I'd like to at this time welcome Mr. Michael Cogdill to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I, I feel like David Lee Roth. This, this, this is cool. John, thank you for that. that. That's cool. Let's give it up for John. He's responsible for the PA. Y'all come gather around. Don't be back row Baptists. Come on. Come on. How many Baptists are in the room? How many drank the Kool-Aid from Southern Baptist Bible School? Yeah. Come gather around. Gather around, ladies and gentlemen. It was two years ago. <clears throat> I had a great honor bestowed upon my life, and that honor was to spend a day on an honor flight with 400 plus veterans in a 727, with a bunch of volunteers and a free ride to Washington, D.C. and back. A free ride and a beautiful welcome. We went to the World War II Memorial, of course. The tears said much more than words would ever say. Then we dropped down to the Vietnam War Memorial. And a Vietnam veteran, Andy Burley, flew helicopters in Vietnam, flew a lot of boys into firefights, and flew a lot of boys out in various stages of brokenness. Andy Burley said something to me that actually made it onto television, but no matter television, it echoes in my heart. He said, you will never die if you're remembered. If you're remembered, you will never die. He said that in front of that wall with 56,000 plus names upon it. Each name a tribute, each name an effort at forgetfulness prevention. Then to Arlington National Cemetery. There was a busload of school children coming out of the theater as the men went in. No one with this school group told these children to do this. They were elementary school children. They recognized these men. Somehow they knew. They knew the generation. They knew the sacrifice these men represented. And they lined up and shook their hands. Didn't need to say a word. Many of them did say thank you. Many of them did say hello. They were from another state, another part of the country. Those men were touched by children as they went in to see the changing of the guard. The changing of the guard happens, of course, at the Tomb of the Unknowns, ladies and gentlemen. Think about this. If you've ever been there, you know. You know how hallowed it is. You know the honor in that honor guard. That is the creme de la creme of the United States military. Right now. There is a boy with a gun over his shoulder walking the map in front of the Tomb of the Unknown. 21 steps, he turns. 21 steps, representing a 21-gun salute, over and over and over. When you go to bed tonight, whether it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, 3.30 in the morning, yes, at 3.30 in the morning, there will be a boy walking the map. No one's watching him. He is all alone in that theater in front of the tomb, in front of that sarcophagus. 21 steps. He turns 21 more. There is no amount of rain, snow, cold, heat. Never stops. Standing there, watching these men take it all in, it occurred to me that the body inside that sarcophagus represents more than the deceased. For far too many, far too many veterans have come home to feel unknown. To feel unknown by their country, by their neighbor. Too often they feel forgotten and unknown. And God knows so do their families. More about that in a moment. We got the men out, and I remember very vividly interviewing a man at 92. He had three bronze stars earned in World War II, European theater. He is weeping. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a young man exit that theater. 
150 yards away. And he walked in his street clothes to those buses. He walked right beside me. I'm in the middle of an interview. This is why you didn't see this on television. I could not cut off the man who had earned three bronze stars. There's just no doing that. That interview had to carry forth. It had to see its way through. But I'm listening to that man with one ear. And what's happening just to my left, as close as this microphone is to me, with the other, that young man who came out, came and he put his hands on one of the vets, and he held him for a while. And he said, sir, you don't recognize me, do you? The gentleman said, very aged, no, no, son, I don't. He said, sir, I was one of the sentinels. In fact, I was the lead sentinel. I led the change of the guard in the theater just now. The men and I saw you men in the audience, and I would not let you get away without saying thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that sentinel, the one who leads the change of the guard that day, had to change out of his dress uniform. He's not allowed to leave the theater in it. He changed out of his uniform, came out in his street clothes to make sure that at least one and I believe he got to about five before he had to go back. Heard the words, thank you, sir. Thank you not only for what you did. Thank you not only for what you were willing to do. Thank you, sir, for what you live with. Thank you for your secrets. Thank you, sir. Back into the theater he went to change and carry on the honor of the Tomb of the Unknown. I am from a town about the size of this room. Weaverville, North Carolina is my hometown. A few years ago, the phone rang in the newsroom at WYFF4. It was a funeral director I had grown up with, Gary West, his name. Third generation undertaker. He said, Michael, we got a situation here I want you to know about it. And I want you to do something about it. We got a young man who has lost his life in Iraq, rocket propelled grenade. His name is Scotty Kinzer. His family was about to move to this town. They're not even from here yet. They were about to move when the honor guard came to their door and knocked and said, he's not coming home alive. Gary said, you would not believe what your hometown and mine is doing for this family. He says, I'm late to the party and I'm joining up. Gary, at his own expense, ladies and gentlemen, had to go all the way to Raleigh to get a horse-drawn hearse. It was a calling he could not fail to answer. We watched, we photographed it, as the man in charge of that hearse and those horses <coughs> polished every piece of tack as if it were the last time he would ever do it. And then into that funeral home. And I sat there in my hometown. They flew me in there, landed between the Baptist and the Methodist churches in the helicopter. It's an ecumenical day. Yeah. The Presbyterians are good too. I sat there with his mom and just listen, just listen as the love poured out of her, the heartbreak poured out of her, the pride poured out of her. It's this mingling of beauty and trauma. His father was a reticent guy, as many of us are, but same with him. But the one who summed it up so well, what these families live with, what the Tomb of the Unknowns represents among the living. Scotty's big sister, with her blue eyes and her red hair, looked at me as if there was no TV camera watching. And she said the words, I'm just gonna miss my little brother coming home alive. And she sighed. 
It seems so simple. It seems so obvious. But as I say his name out loud here these years later, I wonder if she misses him any less. I wonder if she at all feels like she ranks among the unknown. I hope somewhere somebody is doing such a thing as this and inviting the Kinzer family. I hope somewhere somebody remembers not just on Memorial Day, but on any day, to put a hand to her back and say, honey, I'm sorry, how you doing? You doing all right? I know you miss him. I know you miss him. I know all the honors in the world won't bring you back, won't make you feel any better. And then those magic words that I love to say to veterans, thank you, honey, for what you live with. The great living without is a terrible presence to live with. In these United States, after all, we do a really fine job, ladies and gentlemen, of not forgetting. And you go to Washington, D.C., and I don't get to give my opinion very often, but I'm going to give it to you right now. I get livid when I hear people demonize your nation's capital and mine. When politicians say, I'm an outside the beltway kind of politician, I want to say, you need to get your backside inside that beltway and spend some time. Spend some time at the Vietnam War Memorial. Spend some time at the World War II. Go to the Korea, which nobody ever talks about. It's there. Spend some time looking at that bronze, the bronze of the three infantry guys, yoked arm in arm, looking back at that wall. Hardly anybody talks about that or photographs that. It's one of the most meaningful sites in all of Washington, D.C. It is a hallowed place, Washington, D.C., the very heartbeat, the ventricles of the republic, they throb there. If you get a chance to go, go. If you get a chance to take a child, take him or her. And if you get a chance to put your arms around, your hands upon a veteran, a gold star, a mom or dad, do it and simply say thank you and watch. Say thank you for what you live with and watch. I close with this. My father-in-law, George Llewellyn Krimmer. If you are remembered, you never die. I remember him out loud. George Llewellyn Krimmer was 33 years old when he enlisted in World War II. He ended up in the European theater and then he ended up in what ended up being one of the most awful places any boy who ever wears the uniform will ever know. He ended up in Bastogne, the Battle of the Bulge. The hell those boys went through, ladies and gentlemen, reminds us that hell isn't just a hot place, it's cold. Even if you didn't get shot at, they had your feet practically frozen off. Those boys nearly froze to death. Some of them did. But they turned Hitler and his minions back. And they saved the world and came home. Right around Christmas time, they saved the world. My father-in-law, George Llewellyn Kremer, came back physically unscathed. And he never got over it. He would sit at Christmas and just cry. He just wanted to be left alone. I was more a child than a man when I knew that man. He died not long after I got to know him. 55 when my wife was born. Today, I say his name out loud. 
George Llewellyn Kremer, knowing his spirit and the spirits of many others abide within us, among us, as I say to the spirit of that man, what I should have said many times before, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kremer, for what you did. Thank you, Mr. Kremer, for what you lived with. And to all the veterans in this room, veterans, hold up your hands, will you? Hold up your hands. Keep them up. Keep them up. Gold Star Moms. Gold Star Moms, will you come right here? Come right here, Gold Star Moms. Gold Star Wives. Gold Star Widows. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here they are. We don't know fully what they live with, but they will not leave this place today living without a rare red, white, and blue kind of love. Will you join me in giving up a big round of applause for these ladies and these veterans? Thank you. 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 give it up for the Katie's also because this doesn't happen apart from them. They are heroes and they rock as well. Kevin, where's Christy? Where's Christy? I started talking, she went out the back door. Come on up here. We truly love y'all half to death. I won't go all the way. How much do we love them, ladies and gentlemen? What better thanks to you? There they are.